Good evening aspirants, welcome to the Hindu News Analysis by Shankar AS Academy for the date 21st of January 2023. Displayed here are the list of news articles we will be going through today. Before getting into the news article discussion, I have a small announcement. For people who have not subscribed to our YouTube channel, kindly subscribe and hit the bell icon for further updates. Now let's start our discussion. Now look at this editorial article. It is about China's population decline. For a few days, this news has been coming repeatedly in the newspaper. You should think why this news is important. It is significant because China's population story has lessons for countries that have tried robust interventions in social engineering. So in this discussion, we will see what led to China's population decline and the consequences of this decline. Before that, the syllabus regarding this discussion is highlighted here for your reference. You can go through it. First of all, let us begin with some history. In the past, there has been decline in the population of China. It was during the Great Famine between 1959 and 1961. Famine means what comes to your mind? Drought, right? Yes, drought also contributed to the Great Chinese Famine of 1961. But the main reason was Mao Zedong's decision. See, interested aspirants, comment who is Mao Zedong and what is his contribution to China in the comment section. Now coming back, I said Mao Zedong is only responsible for the famine, right? How? Mao decided to launch the Great Leap Forward. It is an economic and social campaign led by the Communist Party. This is nothing but the mass mobilization of country's population to achieve economic development in just a few years. Here Mao relied on Stalin's ideology. Stalin's first five-year plan called for rapid industrialization of the economy with emphasis on heavy industry. This concept was followed by Mao also. So, instead of working in the fields, tens of millions of peasants were ordered to mine local deposits of iron ore and limestone. They were ordered to cut down trees for charcoal to build clay furnaces and to smelt metal. But was this useful for China? No because the Chinese did not produce steel. All they produced were mostly lumps of brittle cast iron which are unfit even to make simple tools. So, while working for this, the peasants abandoned the food production. You can see the food production decline in the 1961 in this graph here. So, this led to famine and consequently the population decline in China. With this information about the past, now let us see the present population decline in China. Firstly, let us see the data given by China's National Bureau of Statistics. According to the statistics, China had 1.411 billion people in the end of 2022, compared with 1.412 billion in 2021. This is a drop of 850,000. As you can see, after 1961, this is the next significant decline in the population of China. As per the data, the number of births stands at 9.56 million and the number of deaths stand at 10.41 million. And here the takeaway for India is that India is expected to overtake China as the most populous in the year 2023. This is the population projection of China and India. Can you see where it is projected to overtake? Yes, at this intersection point that is in the year 2023, India is set to overtake China. Actually, this is good for India because almost half of India's population comes under the working age group that is between 15 and 64. So, India is set to become world's fastest growing economy in the coming years. But at the same time, India should be prepared to reap its benefits of demographic dividend by taking measures such as employment generation and skill development programs. Now, let us see what are the reasons that led to the population decline in China. The major contributing factor is believed to be the one-child policy which was imposed between 1980 and 2015 in China. You can understand what the one-child policy means from the name itself, right? A couple should have only one child. China introduced this policy to reduce the population. See, every country do this social engineering to some degree. Even India has also implemented some family planning programs. But we will see about India's program some other day. Now coming back, the reason for implementing such policy by China is to restrict the exponential population growth of the country. 
This is done because of the scarcity of resources and increasing public expenditure. Here you may have a question. If every country does it, then why it is no a problem for China? It is because China has crossed the line. It strictly implemented the one child policy from the year 1980 to 2015 and this resulted in the prevention of nearly 400 million births. China did not think of the implication of such policy when it first implemented the one child policy. Now what are the implication of the reduction of Chinese population? Lower birth rate means lower percentage of population will be in the working age group. So this means China will not have the benefit of demographic dividend. As per data, a decline of around 75 million since 2010 has observed in the working age group in China. Secondly, the population reduction measures increases the percentage of older population in a country. As per data, the above 60 population has increased by 30 million in China. This will directly affect the public expenditure. This is because the geriatric community should be provided with pension schemes, health benefits and old age homes. As per China's National Working Commission on Aging, the estimate for spending on health care for elderly will increase to 26% of its GDP by 2050. This is the second issue associated with reduction of population in China. Thirdly, as we see from the information given by the National Bureau of Statistics, the country's fertility rate has dropped to 1.3, which is far below the replacement rate of 2.1. See at the replacement rate of 2.1 the country's population replaces itself but since china's fertility rate has dropped to 1.3 due to the stringent population reduction measure china's population is set to decline in the coming years fourthly sex ratio is also affected by the one child policy think about it now what is the mentality of the people people mostly prefer male child right since china strictly implemented the one child policy the people decided that the one child they are allowed to have should be male so this resulted in skewed sex ratio in china you might have heard about the news of lack of brides for grooms in china and the grooms importing women from russia to get married such is the condition of sex ratio in china and this is one of the effect of china's one child policy finally china is going to get old before it gets rich China is the world's second largest economy but in terms of per capita it is still a middle income country so its aspiration to become a developed country like UK US etc will be affected due to its reduction in population these are the some of the main implications of China's decline in population don't you think China has not taken any measures to reverse this trend actually it has taken it introduced to the two child policy in the year 2016 this was done to remedy the wrongs done by the one child policy but the trend of declining population did not change again in the year 2021 china introduced the three child policy it even announced incentive policies such as issuing subsidies to families with two or three child then also population continued to decline a government survey found out the reason for this see 70% of the population cited financial reason for not having more children and they also highlighted the difficulty of raising a child by a working parents so for this reason only china has introduced measures such as flexible working hours for people who are parenting young children work from home options and monetary incentives see for example shenzhen city in the southern china gives annual allowance of over 6000 yuan that is close to 890 dollars to couples having third child or more this allowance is given until the child turns 3 but this also has limited impacts so basically even after taking so much efforts since 2016 due to the couples mindset china's population has continued to decline and its fertility rate has stayed at 1.3 only So that's all regarding this discussion. In this discussion, we saw about China's declining population, the reason for current decline in population in China, the implication of China's own child policy, and the steps taken by China to reverse the trend of declining population. See, this discussion although focuses only on China, India can also learn a lot from the stuff that we just discussed. 
because if you notice in the national family health survey 5 except four states all states in india reached natural replacement level and some states have fertility rate which are very low that is around 1.5 to 1.6 so in 20 or 30 years india will also face the same problems that china is facing currently so we must look at chinese example and take some measures to address the implications that india will face in the next 20 or 30 years so that's all regarding this discussion now let us conclude this and take up the next news article look at this article yesterday the supreme court in its direction held that the state is not obligated to provide the public free access to charge sheet by uploading them on police or government websites a bunch of justice declared charge sheet as private documents and they said putting up charge sheet for public viewing would violate the rights of the accused the victims and even the investigation agency the judges further highlighted that putting up charge sheets for public viewing would be contrary to the scheme of code of criminal procedure this is about the news article given here in this discussion we will learn about charge sheet and we will also understand the difference between charge sheet and fir first let us take charge sheet a charge sheet is a report prepared by the investigation or law enforcement agencies after the investigation process a charge sheet is also referred as a formal police record which contains the name of each person brought into custody then the names of the accusations and the identity of the accusers for your information section 173 of the crpc that is a criminal procedure code deals with charge sheet now why are charge sheet prepared charge sheet is generally prepared for proving the accusation of a crime in a criminal court of law basically the charge sheet is prepared and submitted by the police officer to the court of law this is in order to prove that the accused is connected with any offense or has committed any offense which is punishable under any penal law in india know that the charge sheet which would contain all the stringent records okay that is right from the commencement of the investigation procedure that is from the lodging of fir to till the completion of the investigation and preparation of final report so in simple words a charge sheet is the final investigation report submitted by the police officer to the court for proving an offense in a criminal court of law this is all about charge sheet now before going on and seeing about the difference between the charge sheet and fir first let us see a brief about fir first of all you have to know that section 154 of the criminal procedure code deals with fir first information report that is fir is a written document prepared by the police officer on duty when he or she receives information about the commission of a cognizable offense know that the information can be given either by an aggrieved person or any other person fir is a report of information that reaches the police first in a point of time and that is why it is called as the first information report on the basis of this fir only the police commences its investigation now having learned about fir we will see the difference between charge sheet and fir see the difference is pretty simple the fir is a written document prepared by the police when they receive the information about the commission of a offense whereas a charge sheet is a formal document of accusation prepared by the police after the completion of the investigation this is the main difference between charge sheet and fir so that's all regarding this discussion in this discussion we saw the basics about charge sheet and fir with this let us conclude this discussion and take up the next news article have a look at this editorial which is taken from the hindu newspaper dated 14th january this article talks about deep fakes and the lack of regulation in india to stop the misuse of deep fakes it also talks about the various ways in which deep fakes can be used to create discontent in the society this is what is given in this editorial in this context let us see about deep fakes and the issues associated with it the syllabus regarding this discussion is highlighted here you can go through it now let's start let's start with the question what is a deep fake see a deep fake or fake content which are often in the form of visual or audio format created using powerful artificial intelligence tools they are called deep fakes because they use deep learning technology which is a branch of machine learning to create fake content 
it employs a branch of artificial intelligence where if a computer is fed enough data it can create fakes which behave much like a real person for instance ai can learn what a source face looks like and then transport it into another target to perform a face swap face swap voice swap and even content swap while speaking or some of the ways in which deep fakes are used to create discontent in a society so putting it in short deep fakes is a type of technology which employs to produce fake content which pretty much looks like the real content this is all about deep fakes and the technology behind it moving on the author highlights various concerns with the usage of deep fakes now let's see the issues highlighted by the author one by one firstly deep fake videos can be used to spread misinformation and propaganda see deep fakes if correctly employed will be very much difficult to distinguish from the real content because of its realness deep fakes seriously compromise the public's ability to distinguish fact from fiction this is about the first issue associated with the use of deep fakes secondly deep fakes can be used to malign an individual by depicting them in a compromising or embracing situation deep fake induced to pornography is one such example thirdly deep fakes are now being increasingly used for committing financial frauds see recently scammers used ai powered software to trick the ceo of a uk energy company the ceo of the uk energy company was made to believe that he was speaking with the head of his german parent company as a result the ceo transferred a large sum of money to what he thought was the supplier the audio of the deep fake effectively mimicked the voice of the ceo's boss including his german accent see there has been increasing trend of deep fakes being employed globally to do financial frauds like the one we just saw so this is the third issue associated with the use of deep fakes fourthly deep fakes can be used as weapon to create discontent among a particular community the author says that china with all its digital infrastructure can create doctored videos of indian army to spread discontent in kashmir see this is a very serious issue as already there is widespread discontent among the people of kashmir here note that taiwan is also becoming increasingly concerned that china is spreading false information to influence public opinion and manipulate election outcomes in their country these are all some of the ways in which deep fakes can be employed to create discontent among the public now coming to see the existing regulatory mechanism in india to keep a check on deep fakes see india doesn't have any new regulatory legislation to keep a check on misuse of deep fakes currently very few provisions under indian penal code and information technology act 2000 can be potentially invoked to deal with the malicious use of deep fakes section 500 of indian penal code and section 67 and 67a of information technology act 2000 can be used to contain the problem created by deep fakes other than this the propagation of false information during the election can be curtailed using the provisions in representation of people's act 1951 See these are some of the legislation which can be used to curb illegal use of deep fakes in India currently but the author is of the opinion that India should create a separate law to control the use of deep fakes he quotes the example of China here see China has introduced regulations prohibiting the use of deep fakes which are deemed harmful to national security or national economy These rules were made to apply to content creators who alter facial or voice data in China. The author of the editorial wants India to issue regulations like what China has done in this regard to effectively curb deep fakes. The proposed Digital India Bill should include provisions regarding deep fakes. This is about the opinion of the author to curb the menace of deep fakes. Other than this, Indian government needs to launch a public awareness campaign regarding the use of deep fakes. The campaign must make people aware of the misinformation which can be generated and transferred using deep fakes. Thirdly, deep fake detection mechanism need to be brought in by the social media platforms. 
automatic detection and weeding out of fake content should be prioritized so that doctored deep fakes are brought down immediately these are some of the ways in which deep fakes can be curtailed in india with this we have come to the end of the discussion through this discussion we came to know about deep fakes the way in which it can be used to spread discontent in a society and finally we saw some of the measures which can be taken to curtail the use of deep fakes so that's all regarding this discussion now let us conclude this and take up the next news article have a look at this news article this article is taken from the hindu newspaper dated 15th of january 2023 this article speaks about the wolf warrior diplomacy of china now why is this in news see wolf warrior diplomacy is a aggressive style of diplomacy adopted by chinese diplomats under xi jinping's administration the diplomats who follow wolf warrior diplomacy is popularly called as a wolf warrior in china china's most popular wolf warrior zhao lenjin was transferred to a low profile post and he has been posted in china's border and ocean affairs department earlier Lin Jian worked for China's foreign ministry as a spokesperson. So, the transfer of Lin Jian to a low-profile post has turned the spotlight on China's diplomacy. The transfer also ignited a debate that whether China's diplomacy is undergoing a change under Xi Jinping. This is about the news article given here. In this context, let us understand about wolf warrior diplomacy. The term wolf warrior diplomacy gained popularity mainly after Mr. Xi became the Chinese president. Wolf warrior diplomacy is seen as a tactic which is used by the Chinese government to extend its communist ideology beyond China. Wolf warrior diplomacy mainly aims to counter the western countries and their ideology and it also strives to defend China from external pressure. Now you may have a question whether the term wolf warrior diplomacy is official or not no wolf warrior diplomacy is a unofficial term and it is used by the chinese diplomats for the more aggressive and confrontational style of communication against other nation particularly the western nations now what is the inspiration behind the term the term wolf warrior diplomacy is inspired from a 2015 chinese action film titled wolf warrior this film has chinese nationalist themes and dialogues The film mainly focuses on Chinese fighters who frequently face off against western aggressions. This movie has boosted national pride and patriotism among Chinese viewers. So the term wolf warrior diplomacy was named after this movie. To say simply, wolf warrior diplomacy describes an aggressive style of diplomacy adopted by Chinese diplomats to defend China's national interest often in a confrontational way. Now you may have a question Why is China using this kind of diplomacy? See, there are many reasons for that. Now we will see them one by one. The first reason is that the Chinese leader Xi Jinping is more authoritarian as compared to the earlier Chinese leaders. So, he is using this type of aggressive diplomacy to show his power to the world. The second reason is due to deterioration of US-China relations. See the United States is continuously targeting China in every aspects like trade, defense and so on. So China is using wolf warrior diplomacy to defend its interest. And the final reason is that many countries have been accusing China for the COVID-19 outbreak. So to defend itself from such accusation, China is using aggressive wolf warrior diplomacy. So that's all regarding this discussion. In this discussion we saw about wolf warrior diplomacy and the reason why China adopted this aggressive kind of diplomacy. So with this let us conclude this and take up the next news article look at this editorial article this editorial article talks about the third tier of the government yes it talks about the panchayati raj institutions the editorial is a result of an interaction with several sarpanch and local bureaucrats to analyze the extent of decentralization of powers to panchayats and the result says that in india the powers of the locally elected officials are severely limited in a variety of ways by the state government and the local bureaucrats this in turn is diluting the spirit of constitutional amendments which seeks to empower the locally elected officials this is the essence of the article given here in this context let us quickly go through panchayati raj institutions and the challenges faced by panchayati raj institutions Before that the syllabus relevant for this news article is highlighted here for your reference you can go through it 
Let's start with the term Panjaiti Raj institution. The term Panjaiti Raj in India signifies the system of rural local self-government. Here, local self-government means the management of local affairs by the natives of that area or their representatives. The body is interested with rural development and it has been established in all the states of India by acts of the state legislature to build democracy at the grassroots level. It was constitutionalized only through the 73rd Constitutional Amendment Act of 1992, which means that even before this act, Panjaiti Raj institutions existed, but they lacked uniformity. The powers, roles and the functions assigned to them varied from state to state. So, by enacting the 73rd Constitutional Amendment Act of 1992, the government brought them under the purview of judiciable part of the constitution. That means the state governments are now under constitutional obligation to adopt the new Panjaiti Raj system in accordance with the various provisions of the constitution. They cannot form panchayats and hold irregular elections anymore depending upon the will of the state governments. Every state government must uh, follow the constitutional provisions made by the 73rd Constitutional Amendment Act of 1992. Now, here comes the question. Does that mean states do not have any say in this matter? Actually not. See, the act can be grouped into two categories, compulsory and voluntary. The compulsory provisions of the act have to be included in the state laws creating the new Panjaiti Raj system. On the other hand, the voluntary provisions may be included at the discretion of the states. So we can say that it simply transferred the representative democracy into participative democracy. Now let us understand how they work in real time. Under the act, the Panjaiti Raj institutions work in a three-tier structure, meaning it has three layers, that is the village level, then the block level, and finally the district level. However, a state having a population not exceeding 20 lakhs may not constitute panchayats at the intermediate level. So states like Mizoram, Sikkim, Mehalaya, Tirpura and Goa may not constitute panchayats at the intermediate level. Talking briefly about the three layers, under the act, two bodies have been set up at the village level. They are Gram Sabha and the Gram Panchayat. Gram Sabha is the center of local self-government at the village level. And Gram Panchayat is the executive wing of the Gram Sabha, which makes sure all the objectives of the Sabha should be realized. At the block level, the block or the intermediate level governance is looked after by the Panchayati Samiti. The Panjait Samiti is the intermediate body that coordinates all the activities and businesses of the village Panchayat. At the district level, the apex body that governs the district level is called the Zilla Parishat. It coordinates the activities of various Panjait Samitis. All the members of the Panjaits at the village, intermediate and district levels shall be elected directly by the people. The Act also provides for the reservation of seats for scheduled caste and scheduled tribe in every Panjait. That is, at the all three levels of Panjayat, SC and ST have reservation of seats in proportion to their population to the local population in the Panjayat area. Along with that, the Act provides for reservation of not less than one third of the total members for women. This includes number of seats reserved for women belonging to SCs and STs also. The Act provides for five year term of office to Panjayat in every level. However, it can be dissolved before the completion of its terms. If that happens, fresh elections will have to be conducted. Now moving on to the powers and functions of the Panjaiti Raj institutions. The state legislature may grant Panjaiyats the powers and authorities required for them to function as a self-governing institutions. For this, the state governments may take steps for the provision of devolution of powers and responsibilities. Panjaiyats can prepare plans for economic development and social justice. They can implement schemes for economic development and social justice which is interested to them. They can be given powers to implement 29 matters listed in the 11th schedule. They may also include provisions of finances. The state government can assign to the panchayat taxes, duties, tolls and fees levied and collected by the state government also. They can provide for making grant in aid to the panchayats from the consolidated fund of the state. And they can also provide for the establishment of funds to credit all the monies that is appropriated by the panchayat. These are the powers and functions of the Panjaiti Raj institution. 
Now, let us see some of the challenges associated with the PRI system. That is the Panjaiti Raj institution system. First issue is the lack of effective devolution. Just now we saw about the powers and functions of the Panjaiti, right? Here, the act does not directly empower the Panjaiti. The devolution of powers and authorities to the Panjaiti have been left at the discretion of the states. So, this is the issue because naturally the states willingly will not give up their power to the Panjaiti Raj institutions. Some of the important subjects like fuel and fodder, non-conventional energy resources, rural electrification have not been devolved by the states to the Panjaiti Raj institution. This is the first issue. Moving on to the second issue, the second issue is the insufficient grants or funds. See, despite the constitutional empowerment, the local bodies face problems of inadequate finance to carry out various activities assigned to them. Transfers made through state finance commission are also meager in most states. In most of the states, most of the gram panchayats are found reluctant to raise their own sources of revenue. Only a few gram panchayats are able to generate their own source of revenue in the form of tax and non-tax revenue by renting shop, house taxes and clean water fee. So, the panchayati raj institutions in India have a chronic deficiency of funds to carry out their daily affairs. This is the second issue. The next issue is the Sarpanch Pati. See, even though there is reservation for women, the effective political power and the decision making is wielded by the husbands of the elected women representatives. This phenomenon is referred as Sarpanch Pati. It is still very much prevalent in our society, mainly due to gender bias, women illiteracy and patriarchal society in general. Okay. The next issue is the issue of infrastructure. Some of the gram panchayats do not have their own building and they share space with schools, anganwadi centers and other government buildings. On the other hand, if panchayats have internet connection, they are not functional in many cases. See, even for a simple purpose like data entry, the panchayat officials have to visit block development offices. So, due to this, most of the block development offices are excessively crowded and it delays their work. The other than this, the other issues faced by the Panjati Raj include lack of support staff, lack of convergence of various government programs and lack of capacity building. So, these are some of the issues faced by the Panjati Raj institution. So, that's all regarding this discussion. In this discussion, we saw various constitutional provisions regarding the Panjati Raj institution and we also saw some of the issues faced by the Panjati Raj institution. With this, let us conclude this discussion and take up the next news article. Now look at this article taken from the Hindu newspaper dated 15th January. This article talks about deep water circulation. The article says that the studies of deep water circulation of the oceans are currently based on data generated from Pacific and the Atlantic oceans. To change this scenario, a new research was carried out by a group of scientists from the National Center for Polar and Ocean Research and the School of Earth, Ocean and Atmospheric Studies in Goa University. This group has studied neodymium isotope record from Arabian Sea and reconstructed the deep water circulation records of Indian Ocean. As per the article, the study will help geographers to move away from the Pacific Ocean dominated studies of deep water circulation to include other oceans like Indian Ocean. This is about the article given here. In this context, let us try to learn about deep water circulation in prelims perspective. See, there are two types of ocean currents. One is surface ocean currents and the other one is deep water ocean currents. In this discussion, we are only going to deal with the deep water ocean currents. See, winds drive ocean currents in the upper 100 meter of the ocean surface. However, ocean currents also flow thousands of meter below the surface. This is what is known as deep water currents. As I already mentioned, wind induced surface ocean currents transfer warm water towards the poles while cold water is transferred towards the equator. Now coming to deep water circulation. See, the deep water circulation replaces seawater at depth with water from surface and slowly replaces surface water elsewhere with water from the deeper parts of the ocean. Although this process is relatively slow, tremendous volumes of water are moved, which transports heat nutrients over vast distances. 
These deep ocean currents are driven by difference in water's density which is controlled by temperature and salinity. This process is known as thermohaline circulation. So, we can say that surface ocean currents are mostly influenced by wind while the deep water currents are influenced by difference in temperature, salinity and density of the water. Here note that deep water circulation has often been referred as the giant global conveyor belt. This is all about deep water circulation. Now let us see the significance of deep water circulation. See the deep water circulation helps in regulating the temperature of some of the places in earth. Secondly, it plays a critical role in controlling the atmospheric CO2 levels by helping to transport carbon from the surface of the ocean to the deeper parts of the ocean. Here you have to note that water in the deeper sections of the ocean stores carbon dioxide for longer period of time than the surface water. So, these deep water currents play a significant role in combating climate change. These are the two significance of deep water circulation. So that's all regarding this discussion. In this discussion, we saw the basics about deep water circulation and the significance of deep water circulation. With this, let us conclude this discussion and take up the next news article. Look at this news article here. It talks about India's internal security. This is a news because yesterday, our union home minister spoke about India's internal security challenges while addressing an annual conference of DGPs, IGPs and heads of paramilitary forces in the New Delhi. Now in this discussion, we are going to understand the points as said by the Home Minister. Firstly, let us take Jammu and Kashmir. The Home Minister said that Jammu and Kashmir was gradually heading towards peace and stability. The Minister added that after the abrogation of Article 370 in Jammu and Kashmir, nearly 32,000 children from other parts of country are now studying in Jammu and Kashmir. Then what was the situation earlier? Earlier, children from Jammu and Kashmir used to go to study in other part of the country due to insurgency. But today, the situation has reversed. The Home Minister further added that the amount of investment in the Jammu and Kashmir region has been on the rise. He said that investment has come to Jammu and Kashmir in the last four years is more than what it had come in the last 70 years. He also highlighted that terror incidents, deaths, and terrorist dominant areas have drastically diminished in Jammu and Kashmir. The minister further said nearly 1 crore 80 lakh tourists had visited the Jammu and Kashmir last year, which shows that the entire country is convinced that peace is returning to the Jammu and Kashmir region. This is all about our Home Minister's stand on Jammu and Kashmir's internal security. Now coming to the internal security of the country as a whole. The Home Minister said that the internal security challenges in the country have transformed from geographic to thematic. He said that earlier internal security problems were geographical like the unrest in Northeast, then terrorism in Jammu and Kashmir and left-wing extremism in affected areas. But now those geographical problems have been transformed into thematic ones like cyber security, data security, narco terror etc. See, this is a very valid point that is highlighted by our Home Minister. If there is a main question in GS Paper 3 regarding internal security, you can start your answer with this data that is quoted by our Union Home Minister. If you start your answer by using this data in your introduction, it will give legitimacy to your answer and it will help you fetch more marks. Okay, now coming back. The Home Minister also said that India has attained massive success in curbing left-wing terror. He said that in 2010, there were 96 districts affected by left-wing extremism, but now it has reduced to 46 districts. The Minister also pointed out that over 72% of the security vacuum in the left-wing affected areas has been addressed. He further said, by 2024, India will plug 100% of the security vacuum in the left-wing affected region. So that's all regarding this discussion. See, all the points that is quoted by our Union Home Minister is very valid and all these points can be used in your main sensor. So no doubt the points and try to use it in your main sensor. Okay. So with this, we have come to the end. Now let us take up the next news article. See this article here. The article states that the Supreme Court on Friday decided to set up a five-judge constitution bench. 
this bench will hear pleas challenging the constitutional validity of polygamy and nikah halala practice among muslims in this context let us discuss about nikah halala in exam perspective see in islam halala is a term which finds its root in halal which means permissible and lawful in the context of marriage it means a divorced woman can become halal or lawful to her husband again after a nikah halala is complete Simply, nikah halala is a law that requires a woman to marry and sleep with another man in order to return to her first husband. Islam dictates that a Muslim man has the liberty to divorce and remarry the same woman twice. However, if he decided to dissolve the marriage for the third time, it can only be done after a nikah halala. That is, after two talaqs are over. Remarriage can be done only after nikah halala. Let's understand this with an example. let a be a male and b be a female they are married couples now they are divorced according to this law a can remarry b if b first marries another man c and consummates the marriage additionally a and b can remarry only if c dies or willfully asks for divorce in the context of divorce a bar was laid down in order to ensure that the man does not use this as a tool for torturing his wife the man cannot marry and divorce her as many times as he desired this rule was introduced to maintain strict discipline and to ensure that marriages are not reduced to mere mockery it is said that this rule was established by the prophet himself we know that in india personal laws pertaining to divorces and marriage are anchored in the religion so this law is applicable in india also coming back to the article the petitioner feels that in a patriarchal society religious laws are often lopsided favoring only men laws such as triple talaq and nikah halala are not only archaic they are also weakening the muslim women so they are challenging the legality of these laws in the supreme court that's all regarding this discussion in this discussion we saw some basic facts about nikah halala with this we have come to the news article discussion session now let us conclude this discussion and take up the practice prelims questions We have five practice prelims questions today. Let us see them one by one. Let us take up the first question. This question is about the constitutional bench of Supreme Court. Two statements are given. We have to find the correct statement. Let us take up the first statement. The constitutional bench involves a minimum of three judges of the Supreme Court. See, this statement is wrong because the constitutional bench should have five judges. So, statement one is incorrect. Moving on to the second statement. Case one and the Bardi West State of Kerala case involved 13 judges, and it is one of the largest ever constitution bench. See, this statement is correct. Actually, the case one and the Bardi case had 13 judges, and it is the largest ever constitutional bench ever set up in India. So, statement one is incorrect, and statement two is correct. So, the correct answer here is option B, two only. Moving on to the second question. This question is about the ocean currents. four statements are given we have to find which of these influence the ocean currents the first one is revolution of earth actually it is not revolution of earth but rotation of earth that influences ocean current rotation of earth is one of the prime reason for coriolis force and coriolis force in turn influences the ocean current so statement one is wrong it is not revolution of earth it is rotation of earth second one is air pressure and wind we know from our discussion that wind is one of the important factor that is influencing surface ocean current so statement 2 is correct moving on to the third statement ocean water density see in our discussion we saw that ocean water density is one of the reason for deep water circulation so ocean water density also influences ocean currents so statement 3 is also correct and uh, look at the fourth one it is rotation of earth while discussing the first statement itself i said that rotation of earth is one of the reason that influences ocean current so fourth one is also correct so statement one is wrong 2 3 4 are correct so the correct answer here is option d 2 3 and 4 only moving on to the third question this question is in reference to our charge sheet discussion two statements in regards to charge sheet is given we have to find the correct statement look at the first statement charge sheet is generally the report of police officer that has to be submitted to the court of law on completion of investigation from our discussion itself we know that statement 1 is correct moving on to the second statement section 173 of the indian penal code deals with the charge sheet see this statement is wrong 
because in our discussion we saw that section 173 of the criminal procedure code deals with charge sheet it is not indian penal code so statement 1 is correct and statement 2 is incorrect so the correct answer here is option a only moving on to the fourth question this question is in regards to modernization of police force scheme three statements are given and we have to find the correct statement the scheme is being implemented by the ministry of home affairs this statement is correct so statement 1 is correct moving on to the second statement it is a central sector scheme which is fully funded by the central government this statement is incorrect because it is a centrally sponsored scheme and funds for this scheme is shared between the central and the state government so statement 2 is wrong moving on to the third statement this scheme aims to strengthen the criminal justice system by developing a robust forensic setup in india this statement is correct it is actually the aim of the scheme so here statement 1 is correct statement 2 is incorrect and statement 3 is correct so the correct answer here is option c 1 and 3 only moving on to the last question this is a quiz question for you and this question is in regards to our wolf warrior diplomacy discussion the main questions based on today's discussion are displayed here interested aspirants can write the answers and post it in the comment section if you like today's video like comment and share it with your friends for more updates regarding upsc preparation subscribe to shankara academy's youtube channel thank you